for a visit. And so uh, just pray for my friend, and then we will start the study. So, Father God, uh, thank you for Brian, Lord God, and just uh, what he means to me as my buddy. And, Lord God, the work that you're doing uh, in his life and his family's life, Lord, is indeed a praise report. So we give you all the glory, Lord God. We pray that this morning that we would decrease, but you would increase, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we all pray these things in the power and authority of Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So the, b the name of the study is to Study to Show Thyself Approved. And God has put it on my heart a long time ago that, and we saw this especially with COVID uh, here in, in the world, if you will, not just in our country, that there have been a lot of changes that have occurred. And I believe the vision uh, for Calvary St. Joe is that the sheep uh, are going to be able to feed themselves. So uh, what this study is going to entail is uh, equipping you guys uh, going verse by verse through 1 Corinthians and then 2 Corinthians and talking about how to study the Bible. Do you remember the first time that the light went on for you when you heard the word of God? A um, little background on me, uh, Rick and I uh, were close before. Uh, I started coming to church here before I was born again. Uh, I was a recovering alcoholic, and I would help people because uh, you have to give it away to be able to keep it. So you're working with other alcoholics, and I would say, hey, you're probably going to, you might go through some withdrawal symptoms, so at night, read a boring book, read the Bible. And that's how the Bible was for me at that time. I wasn't born again. There's a Greek preposition regarding uh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit we know is the paraclete, right? So para is a Greek preposition where the Holy Spirit is coming alongside of you, and he's telling you that Jesus is real. And that sin is real, although I was very familiar with sin. And, uh, and that the word of God is truth. And so, uh, long story long, uh, I was at a lot of uh, AA meetings, and God put Christians in those meetings. And they would share scripture with me, and my heart would race. And it wasn't because I had high blood pressure. Um, it was because God was coming alongside, and he was turning the light on. Uh, we have different words that we use. You know, God was connecting the dots in my life through the Word of God. It was powerful. And since then, I can remember Amber and I came to our first Bible study here. Uh, it was the book of Daniel. What chapter do you think was being taught that night? Nine. Daniel chapter nine. And just mind blown. Just the power of the Word of God, the accuracy of the Word of God. And so... That's not something just for leadership. It's not just for Sunday school teachers. It's not just for anybody in leadership. It's for sheep. If you're a sheep <laughs> and uh, you've got a pulse, uh, hopefully this is for you. We're going to be in the English Standard Translation of the Bible. Normally we're in New King James, and uh, I pray that it's a blessing for you. So... Regular planned Bible study is, w without a doubt, one of the biggest keys to spiritual growth in your walk with the Lord. Uh, Jesus made it clear to his disciples, especially in John chapter 16, that it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us all things that he has said. So pastors, teachers, leaders, um, youth group leaders, we're more like scalpels, and God is the great physician. We're just the tools, okay? And so um, hopefully as you guys are reading ahead, as you're studying the Word of God ahead of time, we're going to reach similar conclusions throughout the week. Because I don't know about you, but there have been times where I'm like in a Bible study, and I'm sitting there, and somebody's teaching, and I'm like, you know, I never would have came up with what you just shared with me. And so we're going to go without commentary. Now, we're going to use reference work uh, this morning, and I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, exactly what I'm using for that. But regarding the study of God's word, there isn't a shortcut. There isn't like a magic trick to be able to get, you know, the word of God through osmosis into you. Um, I've read about some people where it's like uh, they woke up one morning and God gave them all these books memorized and I think they're lying. So, <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that, okay? So there are a lot of methods for Bible study, and we're going to talk about several. 
But the best method of Bible study, number one, is read the Bible over and over again many, many times. Now, when I first was born again, I didn't have a job, and I had a paperback New King James, and I got in Matthew, and I headed right, and I did it over and over again. And uh, what a blessing. But we want to read it so that it becomes familiar. It's cognizant uh, of its contents to the extent that we can close our eyes and we can remember how passages read in our Bible. And so um, we're not, just a disclaimer here, we're not doing this for knowledge's sake. This isn't so that you can be like a phone a friend for somebody on the Great American Bible Challenge so they can call you up and say, who were Moses' parents? The number one goal here this morning is to know Jesus Christ, to be close with him, to walk with him, to know his will, to hear from God. Without a doubt, that is our goal. So step number one here this morning, and I encourage you to take notes, or you can watch this on YouTube or Facebook Live at some point. Number one, you have to be born again. You would think that would be a given. It's not. Probably one of the best mission fields on Sunday mornings are the pews, okay? Now, granted, we go out and we go into our workplaces and with our family get-togethers because people love it when we share the gospel with them, but we do that because it's truth, right? Okay? Number one, you need to be born again. If you're not born again, reading the Bible will be like reading the dictionary unless you like reading the dictionary, which I had no social life one summer in junior high and I read the dictionary, but besides that, it's going to be like, what was your most boring class in high school? Anyone? Okay. It would be like that for Mark Milburn, okay? So you have to repent. You have to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. And by faith, if you're asking, praying for him to become Lord of your life, and I'm saying this for anybody who's watching online, if you do, do not do that, you are not born again. And there aren't any grandkids uh, if you will, there are only children in heaven, okay? So you have to know him personally, all right? So that's number one. Number two, we need to approach the scriptures both spiritually as well as intellectually. Uh, an anonymous person said, the heart makes the theologian. And nobody's going to care about what you know until they know that you care. So it's going to be about a heart of love. We'll get to that in the 1 Corinthians 13 chapter at some point. Um, you know, here's some great things to help with a spiritual approach to studying the Word of God. Prayer. Okay? Psalm 119 verse 18 says, Open, open my eyes, Lord, that I may behold wondrous things from your law. Um, I like to pray in John chapter 16, Lord, your Word says that the Holy Spirit will be the teacher, and then continually pray as I'm studying the Word of God. Also, how about worship? Does anybody here ever worship before they study the Word of God? Well, we just did. But do you ever do that on your own? It's a, you don't just do that so we can pass like a half an hour and look at Mark's socks. We do that to get our hearts ready, get the soil of our hearts ready for the planted uh, Word of God, okay? So uh, ask, seek, and knock with God as you study. Number three, Decide what level of commitment you're going to make to studying the Word of God. Some people are just going to read in the morning, and that's, you know, that's just the reality uh, of Christianity. But if you're planning on really studying the Word of God, then you need to forecast hours ahead that you're going to have aside in your week to do so, because I guarantee you things will come up. Plumbing, for example. Things will come up. The dog's on fire. Things will happen. So... We're going to reference some Bible dictionaries, and I really recommend that um, in your um, study of the Bible. I'm going to give you some references here in a minute. Uh, the reference sources that I've used this morning are, is anybody here like the Logos Bible app? It's really good. It's a free app on your iPhone, but Logos Bible software is stellar. That's great stuff. In it, I'm going to use the uh, Faith Life Study Bible, the Lexham Bible Dictionary, um, also, it has the summarized Bible, the complete summary of the New Testament by Keith Brooks. Um, also, you can get a free uh, Smith's Bible Dictionary on your iPhone. And then I've also used uh, Nelson's King James Study Bible and some notes from the old Schofield Study Bible. There are two kinds of study Bibles. One is the kind of study Bible where somebody else has already done the work for you. 
and you open it up, you read commentary, it's got parallel passages sometimes, it'll have little maps in it, and that's one kind of Bible. The second kind is the kind that you do the work in. So I've got a, uh, an ESV inductive study Bible, and uh, it has wide margins, but for each chapter theme, it's got a blank line, so you actually read the Bible and you write what the heading is in your Bible, and that's a great way to do it. We're not going to just rely on somebody else's work. There are various methods for studying the Bible. Now, at Calvary Chapel, nine times out of ten, you we're going to go verse by verse through the scriptures, <laughs> unless we're talking about the tabernacle for the rest of our lives. Then we might go faster, but it's going to be verse by verse, okay? But there is Bible study by paragraphs. Uh, you can read the paragraph carefully for its main thought or subject, and then you can rewrite the text in your own words to find uh, the, relation of the relationship of the important words in that section. Um, I'll give you a simple outline. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, Jesus teaches us how to pray, okay? In verses, uh, chapter 6, 5 through 8, he teaches us how not to pray. Uh, in verse 5, he teaches us how to not be uh, a hypocrite in public. Um, he says in verses 7 through 8, don't use useless repetition. And then he says in verses 9 through 13, here's how to pray and you pray in private to your heavenly Father, Matthew 6.6. 6. You follow the pattern of Jesus' model prayer, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Um, it can also help to look up, does anybody here use a concordance? Thank you. Okay, Logos has a great Bible search engine. Uh, there are a lot of good concordances. If you have the open study Bible, it should have an encyclopedic concordance. And words matter, don't they? We read in the Old Testament, you know, somebody has a baby, what do they name him? Red and Harry. Yeah, they're very literal back then. We've grown so much as a culture since then. But words matter, okay? Um, we'll get to a word study in a minute. There is the synthetic Bible method, and this is the kind of method where somebody reads the Scripture over and over and over again. And so what you're doing is you're trying to get the general impressions of the main ideas and the purpose of the book without attention to the details. Um, there is the historical method. I know that Mike Fisher uh, has put together or was working on uh, a Bible timeline. Did you finish that? Okay. So Mike's still working on the Bible timeline. In some cases, somebody wants to study a period of time in the Bible. And so... Um, the book of Exodus, for example, covers roughly 400 years of Old Testament history. So from the death of Joseph there to the building of the tabernacle, you can study that, and you're going to look at the historical um, events of those 400 years. I know uh, a lot of us have done Bible study for words and for topics. This is very important, and it's, it can be a very fruitful study. What are some of the words that you've looked up in a Bible study before? Abide? Excellent. Abide? Right on. What's that? Okay. Um, how about um, just a topic? Yeah, like, or a word. What kind of a... Marriage. Absolutely. Wonderful. Joy, uh, grace justification, sanctification, salvation. There are a lot of great topics um, or words that you can look up. And we recommend uh, blueletterbible.org. is a wonderful resource. They have an iPhone app. Um, also, biblehub.com ha also has a Bible app. S super helpful. And they, and they have the words in Greek and in Hebrew to help out. How about character studies? The women are getting ready to embark on Elijah. I love that. Uh, one of my first studies that I did here was uh, Elijah and Elisha. Character studies are very fruitful. You might do it for contrast. How about like uh, Saul and King David? Great contrast. Judas and Peter. Wonderful contrast. A lot of things you can do. Samson and Jephthah is one that I've done. Naomi and Ruth. Then there's the inductive method. That's probably what we're going to utilize a lot here. 
and it has three steps in the inductive method. And I know I'm putting you to sleep, but it's observation, interpretation, and application. So observation, you get your five W questions and an H. Who, what, where, when, and why, and how, okay? So what is, you're making an observation, you're going to ask the questions, what does this passage say? When somebody neglects the observation step in this process, without a doubt, it will infect, or it will affect their interpretation, that step in the process, okay? Interpretation answers the question, what does this passage mean? That is huge in our culture. A lot of delicate topics come down to what does this passage mean? And there's th three rules regarding uh, that kind of uh, exegesis. Context, context, and context. What's before the text? What does the text say? What, af what says it after the text? So we're going to use as many methods as we can on our journey. Uh, 1 Corinthians is an amazing book of the Bible. It is not an easy book of the Bible. That's the route that we're going to go. Uh, if you guys keep showing up, like on Sundays and stuff, uh, we'll probably try to hit the craziest books because you are worth it. And we have no guarantee here in the 21st century, in July of 2021, what's going to happen in the future, even with our legal ability to both congregate, but just as far as the direction of the world is going against Christianity. So our goal is that you guys feed yourselves. We work ourselves out of a job. Thank you very much. One person left. Okay. Realize that Bible study is a spiritual discipline, okay? You can watch Jimmy Fallon and be invigorated, open up your Bible, and feel like you're going to fall asleep. It's like prayer. What is the least attended group at any given church? It's a prayer meeting. That's right. Who shows up? Usually the leader. Bible study is hard work. You're going to find yourself more easily tired. Uh, and some people think, well, I'll do it when I feel the motivation. The opposite is true. You do it when you don't feel the motivation, God will supply the rest. Um, Bible study also improves uh, relative to your spiritual appetite. Some people are like, well, I just don't get, I feel like my prayers bounce off the ceiling, or I'm just not getting the word of God. And my question is, is what are you feeding yourself? What's going through the, your eye gate, through your ear gate, through your brain gate? Does that make a difference? Oh, heck yeah. So as a, as a man or a woman thinks, so they are, okay? So we need to do an open assessment. Is there anything in my life right now that's keeping me from growing in the word of God? I've got one word for you that you're not going to like, but I'll tell you what, people use this more for not studying the word of God than any other reason. It's work. I can't walk with God because of my job. That, that's, that's just, it's idolatry. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like I can come up with any excuse. My dog's on fire. You know, my mother-in-law needs shampoo, whatever. The fact of the matter is, is that when you're born again, you've got the Holy Spirit inside of you, and it wants to be fed, and it needs the Word of God. Okay, so this is important. Um, so what kind of things do we need to eradicate out of our lives? What often happens, too, in leadership is that we get spread out too thin. So that what ends up is that you're doing so many things that you find yourself going into Sunday morning, you're like, I don't have study time. So what does the Bible teach us? Balance. Delegation. People that have the gift of administration, we love you. Come see us after service. Okay. All right. Do they care? You care. Okay. Also, Bible study improves relative to fellowship. I love seeing the women get together, and the men. I love seeing the women get together on Tuesday night. They're downstairs. They've got like a million conversations going on at one time. And a guy just walks in, and you're just like, I can't hear all these conversations at one time. There, there are lots going on there. So fellowship. Hanging out with somebody that loves Jesus more than I do looking for people that love the Lord. It's a great thing to do. It will uh, spice up your, uh, your Bible study life. And finally, this is probably the most important part, approaching the Bible study with humility. Okay, somebody said uh, people that think they know everything about the Bible don't. They don't. Nobody knows everything about the Bible, okay? So an attitude of humility, Lord God, just like we sang earlier, 
I need you. I need your voice. I need your direction. It's funny, there are times where you will get a word about a Bible study in an unlikely place. Have you experienced that? It's happened in the shower. <laughs> it could happen in the bathroom. Okay. So the first step in studying the Word of God is to understand what kind of Bible literature you're dealing with. This morning, we're going to be starting an epistle. The word epistle comes from the Greek word epistole. That means letter or message. So epistles were a primary form of written communication in the ancient world, especially during New Testament times. An epistle would have been written on a scroll. And they would have began with animal-type skins, moved on to papyri, which is more of a plant-type-based uh, scroll. Often, the scroll was dictated and then reviewed by the author before being delivered by a trusted messenger. For example, 1 Peter mentions that it was Peter's letter, but it was written down by Silas in 1 Peter 5.12. Paul's uh, letters had a format. You and I... In, we probably don't write a lot of letters. I did when I was a kid. Um, but typically, it would be like, dear so-and-so, and at the very end, you sign who it's from. But in today's culture, or, or back then, I'm sorry, um, they actually told who they were in, in the introduction. So they're going to mention uh, whatever associates are with them when they're writing. They're going to mention their audience, and they're going to give a greeting. And then it's going to be followed by the main body of the letter, and then epistles often conclude with a general blessing, like one of the greatest doxologies in all the Bible at the end of Jude, right before Revelation. Wonderful doxology. It's a way to conclude a letter. Um, often uh, letters were written to individuals, sometimes pastors like Timothy and Titus. Um, okay. We know as a culture, for example, that we use niceties that don't necessarily literally mean what we say. For example, if you go back to the late 19th century and you were talking to somebody and somebody else wasn't present, you might say, give my regards to Beauregard. And they actually meant it when they said it back then. So when you see Beauregard, Chuck gave you his regards. Today, we don't do that so much. In fact, in the 21st century, we might say, hi, how are you? And we're just saying hi. We're not actually expecting a response, okay? That wasn't how they wrote in the Bible. Their greeting wasn't a flowery, sugary nicety. It had meaning, and it had depth. Now, all scripture up to the Gospels in the Old Testament look forward to the cross, yes? Okay. We find the first mention of the church. Now, not an allegory, but the first specific mention of the church in the Bible is in Matthew 16. And it followed Peter's confession, where he said, Jesus, you are the Messiah, all right? Jesus says, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, um, upon this rock, this confession of Peter, I'm going to build my church. And that word is ecclesia. First mentioned in the church of the Bible. So in the New Testament then, the epistles are written after the cross. Jesus didn't give us a whole lot of information about the church. He said the gates of hell aren't going to prevail but he didn't really tell us how to build up the church. Now, at the end of Matthew in 28, he says, go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them. Okay, we got that part. That's good. But what the epistles do is they tell us how to do church. Is anybody here a list maker, a task accomplished person? This is for you. I'm, I am your, your interpreter here this morning. This is good stuff. Um, also, specifically, some epistles like Timothy and Titus were addressed to pastors because we need all the help we can get. <laughs> we really do. And we wouldn't have the qualifications for leadership if we didn't have First and Second Timothy and Titus. Also, where would we be in the Bible if we didn't have Galatians? This is how to walk in the flesh. This is how to walk in the spirit, okay? Where would we be without Ephesians? Put on the whole armor of that you may be able to battle the wiles, the schemes of the devil, all right? Philippians, think on these things, whatever is true, okay? Uh, Colossians, probably the greatest uh, book written about the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the head of the church, okay? So there's a lot of really, really good stuff in the epistles 
I think maybe we should look at the background and get started. City of Corinth. Was it known as the city of Mr. Rogers? Was it like Savannah, Missouri, just a quiet podunk town? Nothing ever happened in Corinth? Not at all. It was known for its sin. In fact, in theater and in the writings of, uh, oh, let's see, uh, Aristotle, um, to play the Corinthian would to play somebody who is immoral or a drunkard. Um, it was a wealthy commercial center located on a narrow neck of land. It was an isthmus. Shall we say that together? Isthmus, okay? Four miles wide. It connected to <laughs> the Peloponnesus and northern Greece. It was a large metropolis, approximately 700,000 people. Two thirds of them were slaves. Um, as a city, it had a reputation for gross materialism and deep sinfulness. There's a chapter in the book of Acts that's definitive on how the church was planted at Corinth. It's at Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. It would appear that Paul had little fruit among the Jews and that nearly all his converts were Gentiles. So, uh, we think that this... Um, this was written somewhere between 51 and 56 AD. We think that Paul may have run short on funds. Upon his arrival, he accepted the hospitality of a famous husband and wife who were never mentioned individually in the Bible. Who am I talking about? Priscilla and Aquila. And they, they like Paul, were tent makers. So they were doing that together. Uh, and then on the Sabbath, Paul would go to the synagogue as his custom, and he would reason with the Jews concerning Jesus Christ. Paul was there for 18 months, according to Acts 18.11. Uh, during that time, he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. He was a busy guy. He was a busy beaver. Also note that there was another church planted in Centria, uh, Romans 16.1, and, and scholars don't know if Paul had a hand in that or not. So why this letter? Anybody read ahead? Did anybody read 1 Corinthians ahead of time? I did, okay. So Chuck did. Um, so Paul had received from two sources in chapter 1, verse 11, verses 16 and 17, of division in the church. And Paul is going to show that this is incompatible with the gospel of Christ. Um, he had also received a letter requesting answers in a series of questions, and we'll see that in 7.1. He felt like he needed to respond to that. Uh, in addition to that, there were other reports not recorded in 5.1. and must have concerned Paul. So he writes to rebuke a divisive spirit in the church. He encourages them towards moral purity. Boy, I wish we could apply this to the world we live in today. What a stretch, okay? So um, he's going to talk to them about doctrinal issues. He's going to urge their participation in the collection at Jerusalem and inform, him of, inform them of his immediate plans. So, who wrote it, from where, and when? Uh, the writer calls himself Paul in 1134, 622, and 1621. Uh, this epistle aligns, aligns itself with the events of the book of Acts and other Pauline epistles. Let's jump in, shall we? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, so he's with Paul at this writing, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, first question. When I'm preparing a Bible study, I ask questions that I would want to answer myself anytime I'm going to prepare a study. So when was Paul called to be an apostle? That's my first question. You find that if you want to turn into Acts chapter 13. We probably have the verses up here. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene Menaean, a, law, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. He's not yet Paul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, 
they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Okay. If you look at a breakdown of Paul's life, there are some times that we don't know exactly how long he was in a specific place. If you go to Galatians, you'll find out that he spent an undocumented amount of time in Arabia. So he has already begun uh, ministering to the Lord, and, and we know that because people were freaking out. Because before, he was killing folks and having them tortured and causing people to renounce their faith in Christ. So the disciples were like, let's have an email relationship with Paul right now. And uh, who was it that extended the right hand of fellowship to him? Barney, Barnabas, okay? His name means son of encouragement. So he handed, extended the right hand of the Lord to Paul, and before you know it, he does a 180 and becomes a dynamo for the Lord. That's in the Greek. No, it's not. Okay. So Paul was sent out by the church. When we recognize somebody's ministry at this church, we're not appointing them into that position. We're recognizing what's already happening. Okay? When we have a Bible study, and Mark and I go way back with this, when somebody shows up and they have the gift of teaching, if they don't intermix with the sheep and minister to the sheep, they have knowledge, but they're not called to, be, to do a Calvary Chapel Bible study because you got to love the smell of sheep, right? Okay? So the church recognizes the call on Saul, who's going to become Paul, and it doesn't tell us how, but the Holy Spirit says, hey, set apart uh, Paul or Saul and Barnabas for the work, and they lay hands on him. But what were they doing before they got the answer? Did you catch that? It was in Acts 13, 1 through 3. Were they just sitting around waiting for a message to come spoken from the heavens and, and did nothing? They were fasting and praying. They're proactive. They're seeking the Lord. Lord, what would you have us do? So the church recognizes what's going on in Paul's ministry, and the church sends them out. That's what we, we want to do here. That's why that's painted above that door. You're now entering your mission field. So uh, Paul's manner and method, again, is to go to the synagogue in town as they arrive and share Jesus with the Jews. Is it an easy thing to be sent out? We got the privilege to, uh, to pray for, lay hands on Josh and Aaliyah Mullins, uh, go into Blue Springs. Always, as you think about it, be lifting them up in prayer. It's not an easy thing to do. When you're planning a church, you're, you're involved in the startup of a church, anybody that comes and leaves, that's a church split. You know, you're like, the church added daily to the church, you know, when they had babies. And so it, it's a tough gig, okay? Let's talk about the synagogue. I have a, a graphic the synagogue, we believe, came as a result of the Babylonian captivity. Anybody know who we think was the big dog that started the synagogue? Ezra is who we think uh, old, old uh, Jewish uh, writings would tell us, okay? Um, sometimes uh, a rich Jew or even um, a friend or a proselyte, according to Luke 7, 5, uh, would have a synagogue built. How many Jewish men did you have to have in order to build a synagogue? Ten, Okay probably connected to the Ten Commandments by a symbolism, okay? Um, by, let's see, in the internal arrangement of a synagogue, we have kind of an analogy. It's kind of a blueprint of the tabernacle by design. Um, at the upper or Jerusalem end was going to be the ark. If you can, I don't know if you can see that in that picture or not. We have uh, kind of a big chest that would be like the ark. Um, and then you had uh, the book of the law. And then there was the... Uh, Sheliak, or Legatus, would have been the officiating minister who acted as the delegate of the congregation, and they were the chief readers of prayers. You might remember that in the time of Jesus, um, the Pharisees and the scribes always wanted the best seats in the synagogue, right? Because they wanted to be a big deal. So I don't think they were really big venues. I'm not sure where the chief seat would be. But... Um, you had what was called the Shazan, Chazan, C-H-A-Z-Z-A-N, and they were the one that opened the doors and made sure the building was ready for service, so they would be like our modern-day deacons. Um, synagogues had multiple purposes because they also functioned as a community center for local Jewish groups. So I don't know if they had game day like we did. You know, they just had a 
kosher potluck, I'm not sure. Um, but it was Paul's custom to go to the synagogue on Sabbath to share the truth about Christ. And when that happened in Corinth, um, they didn't receive him. And he said, look, um, I'm going to wash my hands and I'm going to be about the Gentiles. Now, Sosthenes, his name came up in Acts chapter 18, verse 17. He was a ruler of the synagogue. And Acts 18, 17 tells us that he was beaten uh, before the judgment seat, which is Bema, for being a Christian by the Jews. So he had a lot of persecution going on there. Um, to the church of God in Corinth is specific, but its application is to the church of God in St. Joe. Yes? Amen? Yeah, we, <laughs> we need some 1 Corinthians in this town. Amen? We need some real love. We need some biblical love. Um, again, this isn't a greeting that's like a flowering uh, nicety. When he says to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, anybody here ever uh, studied the book of Revelation? Okay. Yeah, how many letters to the seven churches? <laughs> seven letters. Okay. So you got seven letters to seven churches, okay? What <laughs> I'm doing so well. Um, what you find when you study that is when out of the seven, five of them need correction. The two that didn't get correction, Philadelphia and... Smyrna, okay? So for the five that needed correction, the correction that is needed is found in the first chapter as you look at the description of Jesus, okay? It's one of those kind of light turning on moments. It's really cool. Here, what Paul is doing is he's giving them the correction beginning in the greeting before he tells them what the problem is. It's kind of like Columbo. When you watch Columbo, you already know what happened. You just go through the process. To f Some of you know what Columbo is. So um, trying to find the process of, of uh, what has happened in the crime. So if he says that they are the sanctified in Christ Jesus, translation, they need to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. They had not been behaving like they were sanctified in Christ Jesus. Um, he says, called to be saints together with all those who in every pray place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. One of the hardest things for people that are Christian leaders is you get involved in discipling somebody and you see them hanging out with people that you know are not going to be good for them spiritually. Yes? Amen? It's happened time and time again. We got a great praise report here recently with a brother uh, that has a tremendous testimony. We may have to have him at some point, you know, come share. Uh, but he was one, he and his mom came here uh, 2003. Okay, there's a three involved, three or 13. I took a shot there. And uh, he wasn't ready, you know. He was trying to get off of, anyway, I don't want to go into his details. Um, when he says here, we've been ca called by God to be his holy people, what he's talking about is in Corinth, it was okay, it was socially acceptable as a religious practice to have sex with prostitutes. Today, we just have that in Vegas, um, which is a shame. But back then, that's the level of immorality that was going on. I mean, it was just that much. So imagine being a pastor in a congregation in a city like that. You're just right from the beginning. Paul's not going to waste any words at all. You need to be sanctified. And the way that we do that is spending time with each other. And we need to be able to get along to be able to do that, okay? So number one, we've been called by God to be his holy people, all right? Um, we're going to read, people are getting intoxicated at the communion table. Um, they're proud of not discipling a brother who is with his stepmom. Ooh, even the Gentiles weren't doing that kind of stuff. Um, and so, and then they're dividing, which we'll probably get to next week. Um, so he states his call as an apostle, and then after stating his call, he points them to return back to their call. Now, I want to tell you, I think we've done a disservice to the term calling in Christianity. Because oftentimes we think of calling as like you're a missionary to Nigeria, or your calling is you're to pastor some church or whatever. Calling is hearing from God. Okay? If you go through the book of Acts... Number one, you're going to see Paul's testimony listed three times in that book, and he is continually getting called 
by God, right? It's not like a one-time deal, okay? That's what a calling is for you and I. We didn't just hear from God back in 93, you know, when the stars aligned and God spoke from the heavens and said, Luke, I'm your father, okay? We continually get called by God to do his work, okay? So after stating his call as an apostle, um, he realizes that this is a correction and an instruction in righteousness because one of the most important keys to holy, holy living is spending time with other saints. How do we know this? Look at verse 11. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, which is Aramaic for Peter, or I follow Christ. So the antidote to division is unity among Christians. Is unity important? If I was, and I don't say this very often, but if I was Satan, okay, I would definitely want to get us to be in conflict with each other because then he weakens our ability to be able to minister. I'll give you two great examples. Oftentimes we describe the church as a military base and a hospital, right? What happens during a war if you've got soldiers that are in conflict with each other? Talk to anybody in the military. That's, you, that's a, you can't have somebody like that. They have to be unified or you lose. Uh, this just You would think that would be a no-brainer. In a hospital, how is the healing going to happen when the uh, anesthesiologist and the doctor are in disagreement? <laughs> you're, you're laying there going, oh, no. Healing doesn't happen, okay? People getting ministered to by God's people are affected by division. Okay, bottom line is, I'm not a Republican Christian, I'm not a Democrat Christian, I'm not an Apollos Christian, I'm not a Cephas Christian, right? I'm not even a Jesus Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and we and God are a majority. You and I, plus God, are a majority, no matter what comes our way, Okay. So the antidote to division is unity among Christians. So what we're talking about, if I can uh, kind of get your final attention as we go here to kind of wrap the last part of it up, is that we're talking about an issue of maturity. As a mature Christian, I'm going to find out what hill I'm going to die on when it comes to discussions regarding the Bible. There are some hills, like for example, like virgin birth, that's a closed hand hill that I'm going to die on every single time. You, you don't have the gospel without the virgin birth. When it comes to spiritual gifts, I'm going to have an open hand. That's not a salvation issue, right? That has some, there's some gray area there, okay? So what do we normally think of when we read verse 3? Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the Calvary Chapel interpretation? You can't have the peace of God until you have received the grace of God, right? In this step of inductive Bible study, that's the application. If you go back to the interpretation of grace and peace, grace is a Greek greeting. How about peace? What is shalom? What kind of greeting is peace? Shalom. Hebrew, right? So what Paul is saying is he's including kind of like the equivalent of today's Democrats and Republics, Republicans. He's saying Jew and Gentile are in Christ Jesus. There's no division. There's no male, there's no female, there's no slave, there's no free. Everybody, if you're blood-bought, you're a Christian, okay? That's the attitude we need to look at today. Otherwise, we're losing the war and people aren't getting healing when we're divided, okay? So this greeting has less of an impact on us because we're the Western church. Huge impact on their culture. Verse 4. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that is to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you are enriched in him in all speech and knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. What's the purpose? So that you're not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. What kind of literature have we identified 1 Corinthians as? 
an epistle, right? It's a letter, okay? In the Bible, one of the things we want to keep in mind is that just because this is an epistle, it actually still will include a narrative at times. Um, it can have predictive prophecy at times. And so we're going to talk about different kinds of literature that are contained within uh, the scriptures that we're studying. So we could deal with something that's historical. Um, what I'm trying to do in a situation like this is I find myself meditating on what would it be like to have been involved, been the main person in a church plant for a year and a half, and then you're away, and you get multiple reports that problems are happening, okay? My first question to you is, how do you deal with control in your life? Are you a person that does well with control? Because when it comes to control, there are things that you have a closed hand on that you can have, you can do something about. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, the wisdom of the difference, all right? But in a controlled situation, there are things that you have to have an open hand about that you can't control. Paul can't make the Corinthians repent, right? Otherwise, Christianity would be way different, right? It's a shame, no. Okay, so he can't do that, but what he can do is he can write letters, which are the Word of God, and he can give them Scripture. Amber and I last night were called into a counseling situation, and as we're driving, we're praying, and we're talking on the way there, uh, she was listening to a leadership uh, conference this week, and uh, this lady that I really respect, Gail Mays, uh, the wife of uh, Steve Mays, Calvary Chapel pastor who passed, said, you know what, in a counseling situation, we are not there to give our opinions, right? Because we all got them. How many opinions we got in this room right now? A lot, okay? We're called to listen and to give people scripture. That's what we're called to do, okay? That is what's going to minister to them, right? So that's what he can do. And I'm sure as, uh, and he doesn't have, as far as we know, he, Paul doesn't have any physical, uh, biological children but in a lot of ways, these are his kids. What we're reading is the heart of a pastor, okay? A lot of times when you're in the ministry, your reaction is, what's wrong with sheep? You know, and you want to just have some chuck wine or whatever, forgetting that we are all sheep. And you got to love the smell of sheep. And that's what he does. So I'm trying to think, okay, what's Paul thinking as he's going through this. John and I were talking about this yesterday over breakfast. As a believer, we have to consider what we can control and what we can't control. So the first thing that Paul does is he prays. The first thing he does. I thank God always for all of you that God has given you grace. Have you ever noticed the way that he prays? He doesn't pray, Lord, give me the job at Walmart. I haven't read that in the Bible yet. Okay. He doesn't pray about, Lord, give me a beautiful woman that I need to marry here because I'm a hardworking, you know, Paul, you know. He prays that God gives them grace. Thank you, God, that you've given them grace. That's an amazing thing to, to do. When uh, Amber and I lived um, on this other house in Olive, I found, uh, you ever seen like 70s tracks? Had like this bag. We found in the basement of like tracks from the 70s. They're all like orange and pea green colored, you know like the 70s, and one of the little tracks was this little book, and it was called The Prayers of Paul. Now, normally, we just talk about the theology of Paul, the incredible writings that he did. A great study is how did Paul pray. Very interesting the way they prayed. Very different, I think, to that in the way that we pray. But he thanks God for the grace that he's shown to the Corinthians, and what that shows me is that he has received grace himself. If you know this from studying the Bible— you know that Paul is the apostle of grace. He talks more about grace than all the other New Testament writers combined. Why do you think that, that is? Yeah, yeah, he got so much of it. At the end of his life in 2 Timothy, the last letter that, or epistle that he wrote, he referred to himself as the what of sinners, the chief of sinners. I got to tell you, a lot of us today, if we had the kind of success that he had, we'd be like, well, I'm the chief. And that, that wasn't his perspective. In fact, he never forgot what he had done to Christians before he became converted. He always had that in his mind. So what he's saying is, God, I'm thanking you for the grace that is at the church 
of Corinth, that needs to be a prayer for the church at St. Joe. We will have problems as long as we have sheep, okay? The stall will get dirty because of oxen, is what Proverbs tells us, okay? I want to, as, as I go for my final point here, I want to challenge you. For those that have walked with the Lord for years, over the years, has your prayer life changed? Mine has. I'll give an example of the kind of prayers that I prayed early on. Uh, I could refer you to Judges chapter 6, verses 36 through 40. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew in the fleece only, and it's dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said and it was so one fleece number two fleece number two when he rose early the next morning squeezed the fleece together he wrung the dew out of the fleece a bowl full of water not a spoonful of sugar then Gideon said to God <laughs> do not be angry with me but let me speak just once more let me test I pray just once more with the fleece let it now be dry only on the fleece but on all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. I can tell you, as a young believer, I had a lot of fleeces. Lord, if you want me to marry this girl at McDonald's, tell me. Let me know. He said no. He said, Mary Amber. As... I'm walking with the Lord longer now. I am thanking him for the people in my life. I am thanking him for you. As a young believer, I tended to be very reactive. Okay? And everything had to have been a feeling back then. I find out today, in the way that I'm walking with the Lord, it's absolutely not about the feelings. And if I'm trying to live for the feelings, I'm probably not in the best place in my walk that I need to be with him. So I'm going to learn to walk by faith, and he will bless that, right? He blesses that. So then the best possible solution for those who are disobedient, and, and these sheep are, a lot of them are, is to, number one, say, God, thank you for these sheep. Thank you for these people in my life. There's people in my life, and they're, and they're sinning, and it's, and it's frustrating, and I know that they could be doing things better, but Lord, I thank you for the grace that you've given them. And in that way, I know that my prayers are right. Sometimes our prayers aren't right, and the Holy Spirit has to align them, right? We read in the Psalms, what did David pray? God break their teeth. We rarely say that at Calvary St. Joe. Lord, this morning, break the teeth of our enemies. Thank you, God, for the grace. Thank you, God, for the grace that you continue to give me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it's perfect by design. Lord God, we pray an unusual prayer this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would make us or keep us uncomfortable. Lord God, we pray for stretching. Lord God, we know that oftentimes our flesh wants a mountaintop experience, but we learn more in the valley. I pray for those valley moments for my friends right now here that are gathered together so that we can learn and so that we can grow, and so that what we have to offer a dying world or people that are struggling is the proof of the truth that's only found in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray.